Father White is Assistant Professor of Systematic Theology at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, DC. He is an expert in Thomistic metaphysics and Christology, and is the author of several books, including Wisdom in the Face of Modernity, A Study in Modern Thomist Natural Theology, and he is editor of The Anthology of Being, Invention of the Antichrist, or Wisdom of God. Tonight, Father White is going to be speaking to us about the Virgin Mary as model of the church from Vatican II to Thomas Aquinas. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank again the, the Lumen Christi Institute for inviting me and say what an honor and privilege it is to speak here at the University of Chicago and at the uh, Chicago uh, the Divinity School. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak tonight actually uh, at, at some point about the, the Virgin Mary as a light. Aquinas talks about the Virgin Mary as a light in the church. So not only is, a lumen Christ, is there a Lumen Christi according to Aquinas, but there's a Lumen, uh, uh, lumen Marie. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. The Virgin Mary in the church, uh, the Virgin Mary is model of the church from Vatican II to St. Thomas Aquinas. How does the faith of the Virgin Mary in her earthly life illumine our understanding of the mystery of the church and of the lives of all the Christian faithful? I would like to consider in this lecture the exemplarity of the faith of the Virgin Mary with respect to the ecclesial body of Christ. The idea here touches upon the relation of a set of competing claims in modern Catholic theology. First, there's a claim that the Second Vatican Council understood the mystery of the Virgin Mary as something or someone within the domain of the mystery of the church, an understanding represented concretely by the controversial decision of the Council Fathers to include the Mariological statements of the Council within the context of the ecclesiological document Lumen Gentium. In effect, by what was the closest of votes at the Second Vatican Council, the decision was made to place the teaching on the Virgin Mary in the end of the document on the church. Now, this was significant because you'd had two very major statements in Roman Catholic theology uh, in the 20th, 19th and 20th century on the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary and on the bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary. And it was thought that we needed to have a more um, developed, integral, reflection on that subject. And so the Council Fathers got into a very interesting controversy about whether to include that statement on the Virgin Mary within the document on the church or as a separate document. And it was the closest vote at Vatican II. It was a vote that was narrowly won by those who decided to place the, the, the Mariology within the mystery of the church, as it were. In one reading of this decision, the Virgin Mary is an archetype of our salvation in Christ because in her person she instantiates in an ideal fashion the process by which divine grace transforms human nature. She is the most human among us. The Christocentric perspective of the Council is thus seen as ecumenical in orientation. All Christians agree that the church is centered on Christ, and Mariology is then reconfigured around the concerns common to all Christians of the doctrines of salvation and sanctification in Christ. She is, by her immaculate conception and bodily assumption, the most saved, the most redeemed, the most turned toward Christ, the most exemplary of what it means to be justified, and so forth. Against such an aspiration, so it is often said, an important minority position who narrowly lost the vote sought to give theological priority to the unique privileges of the Virgin Mary, which would be made manifest by a separate document on her mystery. So a second competing claim thus emerges, if you take the logic of their argumentation seriously. On this view, the mystery of God's grace at work in the Mother of God is not reducible to the life of grace among other believers, for we cannot simply assimilate the intelligibility of her mystery into the imminence of all other believers, since her privileges are sui generis, and an acknowledgment of them forms an integral part of the doctrine of the faith. The mystery of the Virgin Mary is not entirely reducible to the perspectives of a doctrine of sanctification which would be applicable to all others, for she is different than we are. 
Of course, the two perspectives need not be opposed to one another. Arguably, the ecclesiology of the Council Fathers did not cause them to underemphasize the dis irreducibly distinct sanctity of the Virgin Mary in differentiation from others and her unique role in salvation history as the Mother of God. If it did not, however, then how are these two truths interrelated? And I am claiming the two things I'm about to say are true. The ecclesial exemplarity of the Virgin Mary and her uniqueness as the mother of the Redeemer. She is the example of the church, the perfect archetype of the Christian life, and she is the unique privileged mother of the Redeemer. How ought these two truths to be simultaneously understood? In what follows, I will consider briefly four ideas that are co coordinated with one another. Each touches upon the corporate nature of the church as related to the sanctifying grace of faith. In doing so, I'm going to consider two mysteries. The presence of the Virgin Mary at the crucifixion and the assumption of the Virgin Mary uh, in her, in her, at the end of her life, the bodily assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into the life of Beatitude. And I'm going to consider each time, in turn, both the corporate or ecclesial aspect of what the Virgin Mary has in common with other Christians in these, in these mysteries, and then the unique aspect of her privileges. First, how is the intercession on behalf of others of the Virgin Mary at the cross rooted in the congruent merits of her faith, hope, and charity, a merit that is common to other believing Christians, Second, how does the distinct privilege of the, Virgin Mary, of the Virgin Mary's merits shine forth by way of her unique association with Christ in the saving event of the Passion? Third, how is the beatific vision to which the faith leads human persons in some real sense essentially corporate or communitarian? Heaven is a communitarian mystery of belonging to a body, an ecclesial body. Fourth, then, how is the beatification of the Virgin Mary in her assumption in some way the exemplar or model of all ecclesial sanctification even while her divine maternity is manifest in unique ways in the privilege of her assumption? Traditionally, the majority of theologians have considered that the Virgin Mary, from the time of her conception, received a greater plenitude of grace than any angelic or human creature has received even at the term of his or her existence. Marian holiness in the order of faith, hope, and love, the infused virtues, as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit, must begin at a higher echelon than exists for any other creature subsequent to an entire lifetime of cooperation with God's grace. The Virgin Mary starts off ho more holy than Little Flower finishes on the deathbed. And yet, two caveats are necessary. First, this need not involve any extraordinary form of consciousness in the Virgin Mary, if by that we are referring to charismatic or prophetic phenomena. According to the traditional understanding, her faith is primarily contemplative and not apostolic in expression. Her extraordinary understanding of the mystery of Christ to the extent that it must have existed through the process of her understanding in life was integral to her personal maternal relationship to Jesus and to his mission, which was in turn interpreted publicly by the apostolic church. What I'm saying here is, if you believe the Virgin Mary was holier than anyone from the very earliest period of her life, that doesn't mean you have to think she was having extraordinary revelations or that she knew everything all the apostles knew later, or something silly like that. You're not, you're not obliged to go down that road. Second, whatever plenitude must have existed prior to her pregnancy with Jesus the Word incarnate, she must also have undergone a tremendous growth or development in faith, hope, and charity subsequent to the incarnation and by way of her participation in the redemption. Traditionally, it is thought that this development reached its apex in the mystery of the crucifixion. And it is a doctrine of faith that the Virgin Mary grew in the theological virtues and that she developed in perfection through the course of her life. This participation of the Virgin Mary in the mystery of the crucifixion by way of her inward acts of faith, hope, and love is deemed, by traditional language, her compassion, co-suffering, and this act of union with Christ crucified is understood in the long-standing theological tradition to have had a meritorious character. In thinking about this mystery, we can make a transition between what the Virgin Mary holds in common with us, albeit in a wholly exemplary way, and what her is unique to her alone.
However, this transition is a subtle one, and in a certain way, it is not an abrupt one. We have first to make a distinction in the order of merit, not between Mary and all other redeemed persons, but between Mary and all others together in distinction from Christ. Here, Aquinas takes up and develops the traditional language of merit by distinguishing between that merit which he calls condign or of full dignity and that which is congruent or fitting in kind. The distinction between condign and congruent merit is not something Aquinas made up. It was a typical uh, uh, distinction employed in the Middle Ages and it was used in the magisterium of the Catholic Church's teaching at least down through the early part of the 20th century and what those terms signify is still signified in often other more contemporary language uh, in contemporary writings of the, of the magisterium. Aquinas has his own interpretation, however, of those terms, and it's that interpretation I'm going to explore here briefly. Aquinas takes up and develops the traditional language of merit by distinguishing that marriage merit which is condign or a full dignity and that which is congruent or a fittingness. Condign merit is reserved by Aquinas to Christ alone because he alone can truly atone for human wrongdoing in a radical and utterly righteous way. Aquinas underscores that God need not have redeemed the world by means of the incarnation and suffering of the Son, and had he not done so, he would have redeemed the world by he could have redeemed the world by sheer mercy without undue prejudice to divine justice. And in this, he's arguing a little bit against Anselm, who seems, to who seems to suggest that if God did not become incarnate and if the cross did not occur, God simply could not have really redeemed us. However, Aquinas says, it is more merciful to redeem the world in justice, in and through the righteousness of Christ, who satisfies for human sin in the fullness of justice before God by substitu substituting his human obedience and charity in place of our defective lack of love and obedience. So it is more merciful to redeem the world in justice than if God had redeemed the world in sheer mercy. Because of the plenitude of Christ's grace as man and the dignity of his person as God, his acts of reparation on our behalf bear within them an infinite dignity, the dignity of the God-man. The merits of his passion then are utterly sufficient and even superabundant as an atoning offering for all human sins. Furthermore, this condign merit, this merit of plenary dignity or worth that comes from Christ alone is made ours or given to us by way of real participation in faith and the sacraments so that we are justified by faith and baptism in Christ with the very merits that Aquinas possesses that Aquinas excuse me that Christ possesses as the head of the church I mean St. Thomas says something very strong he says when you are baptized and when you live in faith you partake of the condign merit of the cross of the plenary infinite dignity of Christ crucified as God and man by participating in his very dignity as the Son of God. It's a very powerful statement. Congruent merit, meanwhile, pertains not to Christ, but to the purely derivative graces of cooperation that come from Christ or that are given by him to those who participate in his mission toward others in such a way that their prayers and good deeds accomplished in faith are a kind of participated wellspring of, ga of grace given to others. Can you merit grace for other people? You know, if the saints pray for others, can they merit grace for other people? Here we are no longer speaking about an order of necessity, but of one of pure gratuity, in which Christians are invited to participate in Christ's giving of divine life to others by their prayers and actions, not because God needs them, but because God by grace has wished them to cooperate in the mission of Christ out of a shared life of friendship with God in charity. Aquinas says that the virtue of charity creates a friendship with God, and that in that friendship God asks the friend to participate in Christ's mission towards others, and by a kind of fittingness of the love of charity, gives the life of the, the apostolic life of the Christian a kind of participation in the merits of Jesus. But it's by a, not any kind of necessity, but by a kind of superabundant gratuity. Such intercessory merit is merely fitting rather than condign, but it is truly fitting in that it is the expression of a deeper wisdom and love of God who wishes to assimilate the saints as his friends into his own work of salvation by a sheer mystery of gift. 
and as a yet deeper expression of the power of the all-sufficient sacrifice of Christ to redeem the world. The congruent merits of the saints in respect to others are not then detractions of the office of Christ as high priest, but rather are expressions of the plenary riches of his one and true saving priesthood. Their graces unveil the riches of the inner plenitude of the redemption accomplished by him alone. When the, when the, when the contemplative nun prays for the salvation of souls, when the active sister, when Mother Teresa or someone, you know, makes sacrifices in her daily work for uh, the salvation of souls, offering those things as prayers to God, that is a, there's a bond of friendship that does not diminish the unique saving efficacy of the cross, but magnifies and manifests the power of the unique saving efficacy of the cross. With these qualifications in place, which are generally ecclesial, we can note first, of course, that the Virgin Mary's act of union with Christ crucified by way of her faith, hope, and love is meritorious only in the order of fittingness by a congruency of God who wishes her friendship with Christ to stand at the center of the divine economy of salvation at Golgotha. She is there while the mystery of redemption unfolds in its most ultimate hour, her action adds nothing to the grace of her son, but on the contrary, insofar as it is truly inspired by God, derives entirely from him, Christ, and returns to him in prayer. She is vitally dependent at the cross upon Jesus and is for Jesus. In, it, is she who is assimilated in, uh, it is she who is assimilated into his mystery of redemption in a preeminently Christ-centered fashion. In this way, she exemplifies something that is common to all believers in this life, the capacity to suffer meritoriously in faith, hope, and love, in union with Christ crucified, and in utter dependence upon him, in such a way as to make an offering of one's life on behalf of others. However, there is a sense in which she is also unique or privileged and unlike any other person, precisely in the way that she participates in this event. Aquinas alludes implicitly to the idea in his commentary on the angelic salutation of Luke 1.28, Hail Mary, full of grace. He writes this, and here he talks about the light of Mary. The plenitude of grace in Mary was such that its effects overflow upon all human beings. It is a great thing in a saint when he or she has grace to bring about the salvation of many. But it is exceedingly wonderful when grace is of such abundance as to be sufficient for the salvation of all human persons in the world. And this is true of Christ and of the Blessed Virgin. Therefore, Mary is full of grace, exceeding the angels in this fullness, and very fittingly is she called Mary, which means in herself enlightened. Quoting Isaiah 48:11, the Lord will fill your soul with brightness, and she will illumine others throughout the world, for which reason she is compared to the sun and to the moon. Now, Aquinas' etymological rendering of the name of Mary is here seemingly inaccurate. That's not a correct linguistic designation of the meaning of her, of her name. The theological idea, however, regarding her congruent merits is quite clear. First, the Virgin Mary intercedes in union with Christ in the very hour of the crucifixion, she understanding at some level what is taking place and uniting herself to him in prayer on behalf of the redemption of humanity. Now, just to make this clear to you, this is not a private theology or a personal theological school of thought. This is a doctrine of the Catholic Church taught nowhere other than in the Second Vatican Council. That the Virgin Mary understood in her faith what was happening at the hour of redemption at Golgotha and that she stood fast at the cross. As John says in his Gospel, she stood at the cross, which is understood traditionally by the Church to mean she understood and contemplated the mystery uh, in the midst of her suffering, assenting to the fact that Christ was redeeming the world in her faith. And so uh, it's not a, a piety, it's not a personal projection, it's not theological theory, it's an infallible teaching. Therefore, uh, her merit is differentiated from that of all other saints by the fact that it is universal in extension. 
She alone participates with Christ in the redemption of the entire human race in and through the event of the cross. She prays for the salvation of all human beings. In that sense, her congruent merit is different than that of any other saint in that she's there in the moment of the redemption, uniting herself to it in solidarity with the salvation of all sinners, the mother of sinners. Second, however, Mary's meritorious participation in the redemption of others is not only the most extensive in kind, but also the most intensive. She accepts in faith the crucifixion of her son in a unique intensity of holiness derived from the inner perfections of grace that enshroud her soul by virtue of her immaculate conception and by which she is free to cooperate in faith in this mystery with a profundity that is proper to the mother of God alone. She loves God more intensively than anyone else. In doing so, she becomes from within her divine maternity at the cross, not only the mother of Jesus, but also the mother of the church, the mother of all the faithful and of all the redeemed. John's Gospel uh, portrays the symbol of this mystery in Jesus' decision to make the Virgin Mary the adoptive mother of the beloved disciple, woman behold your son, son behold your mother. It is because she is the mother of God in faith, by her free consent to the incarnation at the Annunciation, that the Virgin Mary allows herself to then be further conformed to the mission of the person of Jesus, her son, in the midst of the crucifixion, in her meritorious loving compassion for the crucified Lord, her co-suffering with, in faith, the redemptive Lord. And it is precisely in living out her motherhood towards Jesus in this way that she becomes in the order of grace and by her intercession, the mother of all the faithful, the mother of the church. Jesus asked the Virgin Mary, even from within the martyrdom of her motherhood, so to speak, to become the mother of the church. He asked her to go further in the gift of herself, even as he was going furthest in the gift of himself in the crucifixion. Let's turn now to consider the final term of the life of faith. Why does God give us faith, supernatural faith, according to the teaching of the church? It leads us and guides us into the intimate vision of God that faith succeeds itself to, that faith terminates in the life to come in the vision of the essence of God, the beatifying vision or beatific vision. And the way, let's consider the way in which the assumption of Mary at the end of her life typifies the final end of the ecclesial life of faith. We should note first that the beatific vision, what we call colloquially heaven, is itself a mystery of common life. The universe and the world of living things, and especially the world of rational creatures, I mean by that angels and men, I don't want to practice any violations of the politics of identity here, and so I should include the angels, we should not exclude them. They are all made ultimately for God, these rational creatures, who is, as Aquinas notes, the ultimate common good of the whole creation. Everything exists ultimately for a shared life with God. If God is the transcendent common good of the whole cosmos, then spiritual creatures who enjoy God by the direct vision of his essence partake of the greatest communitarian shared life. There is nothing so great to have in common between souls as the love and knowledge of God, and so there is no greater common life that builds a deeper bond between human beings than the life of beatitude in heaven. It's the only politically, pol politically perfect community. For this reason, Aquinas will underscore that the beatific vision has an intrinsically communal character. This is the case for two distinct but related reasons. First, because the vision of God is one shared by all the blessed, such that their joy and restfulness derive from the same source. All possess the vision of the unique triune God. They have the same good in common. Second, however, they all know not only God, but also one another, each in his or her uniqueness and complementariness. This is not a collective knowledge merely of a conglomerate of individuals, but is the participation of each one in a shared life that is common to all. They are therefore happier because of a shared life, a collective happiness, attaining to each one personally in a distinct and unique way, but impossible without participation in the whole. They're happier because everybody else is happy, but they're happier that they're happier because each one is happy in just the way he or she is meant to be happy. So it's the particular personal beatitude of the other that makes the other the others happy. It's like a symphony or a, a kind of harmony of differentiated and yet deeply complementary forms of life in God. 
This is true even on lesser levels. Think of the collective happiness possible by living in common in a family or in a university or in a religious order and so on. The collective life of living in the greater share of the good of the whole uh, beatifies or makes happy each one in a limited way and we take happiness or consolation from the participation uh, in happiness of the others. This collective life of the blessed in heaven is also marked by degrees of perfection in love and an insight into the mystery of God that are attained by individual human beings and angels. And such a hierarchy of sanctity is not something alien to this collective good, but in fact enriches that very good and gives rise to it or helps to constitute it. Now it is also a teaching of the church that there is a differentiated hierarchy in the order of beatitude in heaven. It is it is not a egalitarian society. So you could say, well then I don't want to be there. That would be a great error. Because the hierarchical differentiations give joy to each one in a way that is not alienating. Even a thoroughgoing uh, axiomatic Marxist would be happy. The difference of degrees of holiness is not a source of mutual alienation or spiritual sorrow then, but of mutual friendship and enjoyment. It's nice to be with the saints. We like it. The saints make us happy, even because they are holier than we are. There is a mutual and reciprocal delight among the blessed to encounter the distinctness of graces that each one receives, including hierarchical degrees of participation in the divine nature, which is determined, after all, by the degree of charity. And to be loved more intensely is, after all, not unenjoyable. The holiness of the soul of St. Bernard or St. Teresa does not cause mourning, but delight. Consequently, the blessed are not fulfilled only from God, but all are also precise, but also precisely in their deification in God. They are a source of friendship to one another, partakers in a mutual shared life, and enriched by a, a dense unity of spiritual goods. Of course, everything I'm saying presupposes that we have a soul that has an immaterial dimension to it and there's life after death, which means there's also the possibility of eternal damnation, a sadder subject, which alas, we're not going to have time to talk about today. And you know, then there's all kinds of philosophical consequences to holding those, these ideas and they have to be defended in public and they can be argued for to some extent rationally, philosophically, and those who hold for a purely materialistic conception of humanity, we can argue against them in various ways and say that that's going to undermine a lot of basic goods in reality. And I realize all that, but I'm, I'm talking about heaven right now. So I'm not, I'm not ignoring that there's a philosophical aspect of this whole set of commitments. I'm just bracketing them. What is it that accounts for the differentiation of degrees of beatitude in heaven? It is not the degrees of faith during one's earthly life that we have alluded to in the previous section of this essay. Formally speaking, that cannot be because sanctification in the vision is based not on the intensity of faith per se, but on the intensity of love. Although, those who love God most typically have the most intense faith. The degree of beatitude we attain to in the world to come is the direct effect of the degree of charity, supernatural love, that we attain to in this life. While knowledge is assimilative, it takes in the reality, you know reality that you take into yourself intellectually by knowledge, charity is appetitive. It desires the good. It goes out from itself. And in that sense, it's spiritually ecstatic. It takes, out, it takes us out of ourselves into the other, in this case God, who is the transcendent good, who is desired and loved above all else by grace. But in just this way, because charity in this life opens the spiritual soul in vulnerability to the mystery of God's own life, conforming the soul's inward powers to God himself by an eccentric movement of the self out into the divine, Therefore, divine love is the most perfect and most proximate disposition for union of the spirit with God by vision. Love prepares you best to see God. Love, in a certain sense, stretches the spiritual faculties to dispose them to divinization in an incomprehensible, utterly transcendent reality, by an, sorry, by an incomprehensible, utterly transcendent reality in a way that knowledge alone cannot do. St. Thomas says, with everything that's less than a human being, it is better to know that reality than to love it, even with a dog or a cat. 
It is better to know it than to love it. But with a human being, because it's more intelligible to us than it is appetitive in the order of goodness, but with a thing that is with a, a spiritual reality, a human being or God especially, it is better to love primarily as the context for knowing, because the human being is always more than I can reduce to my intelligibility of the human being. Even if I know a lot about what a human being is and make a lot of progress and get to know this particular human being very well, there's always a way in which there's something in not fully comprehended and in a, having a dignity I cannot completely assimilate to my understanding. So it's better to love the person and then seek knowledge within love. And if you don't do that, you end up imbalanced. Not psychologically imbalanced, but spiritually imbalanced on a deeper level in psychology. And with God, this is all the more true because God is so transcendent and incomprehensible. We will grow in knowledge of God to the degree that we reach out in the affectivity of love. And it prepares the love of charity, conforms the soul to God, so that it prepares the person to be lifted up into God beyond just what we understand of God or beyond the limited measure of our understanding even of the faith. So if a great theologian like a Bonaventure or Aquinas doesn't also love God in a very high, intense way, um, the degree of sanctification his theology will afford him will be limited. But if he uses that knowledge to uh, grow in the appetite for union with by charity, it's going to dispose him more proximately to the deification of heaven. In light of this consideration, let's consider the mystery of the Assumption as exemplary for the life of ecclesial faith. When we consider the passage of the Blessed Virgin Mary into the beatific life of glory, we must of course affirm that this is accomplished by the assumption of her body and soul into heaven. It is perhaps theologically advisable here to follow the more traditional understanding of the assumption that this event was preceded by a true physical death of some kind in which the mother of God, though sinless, was conformed in faith to the death and resurrection of her son. I, I think it's theologically preferable to hold that the Virgin Mary died physically before the bodily assumption. This was a final earthly expression of her uni union with the crucifixion, albeit one that announced the near immediate transformation of her body and soul into the state of glorified life, an event patterned ontologically after the example of the risen life of Jesus Christ. She's conformed to Jesus. What has this event to do with faith? In effect, the assumption of the Virgin Mary is the place of encounter where faith attains to its final term or purpose transitioning into the beatific vision of the life of God. It is also where the communal dimension of grace has its deepest expression and realization. The Virgin Mary is, in her faith, in the midst of death, a model for all Christians of the passage by grace into eternal life. Here it is interesting to note that we are not dealing with a mystery characterized particularly by either joy or sorrow, by either the presence or absence of God, but rather by the stillness of a deeply oriented contemplation that has nothing left to desire other than deifying union with God. In other words, at the end of her earthly life, the Virgin Mary, who never ceased to grow in faith, hope, and charity, has attained to the plenitude of grace in which she was, to which she was destined in this life. The faith of the Virgin Mary at death, then, is the nearest it ever will be to the fulfillment of the life of grace towards which it tends inherently, for supernatural faith tends inherently towards the vision of God. Vision, however, tolerates no intermediary, but is only ever immediate. You immediately see God intellectually. It's a metaphor of seeing. You know, you perceive God intuitively directly in the vision. Vision tolerates no intermediary, but is immediate. In the proximate preparation, then, for the deification of her soul's spiritual faculties, the Virgin Mary, living before death, living before death in faith and charity, enjoys the deepest proximate union to God possible without the presence of the vision per se as an immediate prelude to her vision. She's on the horizon of beatification in the deepest proximate preparation. She's like at the, the dusk right before the sun rises. Some theologians, understandably then, have characterized this event as a moment of extreme darkness of faith, but also of complete calm. The darkness comes from the character of faith exercised in this extremely elevated mode. She has no prophecy, no mediations, no ecstasies, no consolations, however exalted, because none of these can substitute for the vision of God toward which her soul tends quietly in the waiting for the vision and to which it aspires under the supernatural influence of grace. Consequently, the obscurity of the faith is most intense right before she dies and extensive 
in this hour of death, conforming all the powers of her soul to God and preparing them from within, as it were, for deifying union. Yet this darkness is not angst-ridden or tormented, but is utterly peaceful. This is, an, this is on account of the will, the love by which the Virgin Mary is transported into God is so utterly elevated at death that she possesses the object of her desire in hope with a sureness and fixity, a centeredness of the will, a calm, a depth of totality that is unique and that unites her heart and her soul with the mystery of Christ even through death in a way that is utterly final, peaceful, and solemn. The Virgin Mary dies in Christ without even a shadow of disunion. The irreducible uniqueness of her life appears in this mystery more poignantly in her resurrection or glorification in both body and soul. Evidently, the glorification of her physical body prior to the time of the universal resurrection is an extraordinary privilege that shows forth in a unique way the fruits of Christ's redemption. The Virgin Mary is prematurely raised from the dead, we might say, in a way that anticipates the universal resurrection. That's a clearly a great privilege. The Virgin Mary is in this mystery particularly the new Eve, the most solemnly redeemed creature, so John Henry Newman rightly emphasized. Nevertheless, the glorification of the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary by virtue of the beatific vision also communicates to her a distinct set of privileges. By her beatific vision, the Virgin Mary has a unique degree of insight into the essence of God and deifying familiarity with the persons of the Most Holy Trinity, evidently based precisely upon the ground of this union, the depths of charity that she attained to in her earthly life by virtue of the grace and predestination of God. She is most friends with God of all the saints. Her intensity of charity entitles her to unique depth of intimacy with God. Furthermore, however, her vision pertains not only to the incomprehensible essence of God, but also to the members of Christ's body, who she is given to know in God in an elevated and mysterious way, with a universal extension that she shares with no one other than Christ. In other words, in her beatific vision, the Virgin Mary is given to perceive the life of the church and to know the members of Christ's mystical body in the light of the life of God. And that is something very strange and mysterious about what Catholics rightly believe about the Blessed Virgin Mary. She knows us. She knows the people in the church. We kind of believe that. I mean, your average Catholic saying the rosary on a Saturday morning after Mass, who's a bit keen, has this idea that the Virgin Mary knows something about what's going on in the world. But you don't thematize it. But it's because of the privileges of her beatific vision. What this knowledge must be like completely evades us, but that it is real is inevitably a doctrine of the faith, for the Blessed Virgin Mary is a, un is a universal patron and intercessor for the whole of the church in a way that is not proper to any other saint. And this is only possible because of the graces of intellectual illumination that she receives in the vision of God. It follows from what has been said that the assumption introduces Mary into a life that is centered around the triune God and the knowledge of the risen Christ but which is also perfectly ecclesial in scope. Not only does she possess the deepest intensity of the vision of God that is found in any creature outside of the sacred humanity of Christ, but her vision is also of the greatest extension as it extends to the perception of the personal uniqueness and holiness of all the members of the church in heaven and on earth in their hierarchical, per hierarchical perfections and complementarity. She is, as it were, the apogee at the central heights of the geometrical splendor of heaven. That's why she's in the middle of all the pictures. You know, you think, well, those are just pious pictures of the medievals and the Renaissance, but there's a reason she's in the middle of the picture at the Sistine Chapel when Christ comes in glory. She's looking around at everybody. That's a visual image, but it actually corresponds to an ontological claim. It's taught through the simplicity of the picture, but the picture denotes something very, very deep. In this, in this place of being in the apogee, she frames the entire uh, symmetry of heaven from which heaven receives its balance, its symmetry, in subordination to Christ, the heart of all things, from whom the whole edifice receives its foundation and cohesion. I mixed metaphors, but you'll, you'll forgive me. We, begin this we began this presentation, which I'm finishing, with a question. How are we to understand the inner relationship of the ecclesial exemplarity of the Virgin Mary and her uniqueness as the mother of the Redeemer? In what sense is her faith characteristic of the Christian life yet realized to an exemplary degree? And to what extent are her privileges as the mother of God unique and incommunicable and thus in some sense 
You might say outside of or transcendent of the common ecclesial life of the faithful. In answer to this question, we can pose three basic conclusions. First, the graces that the Virgin Mary shares with us as Christian believers and those that she possesses in a unique way are clearly to a certain extent distinguishable, but they are in no way separable. Her congruent merits, both in her earthly life and in her heavenly intercession, are the highest instantiations of mysteries of saintly intercession that are in fact genuinely shared by others. And yet they are present in her person uniquely bound to the destiny of Christ such that she is a unique creaturely intercessor on behalf of all other human beings. The boundaries between her inclusion in the common polity of the church and her transcendence of that polity are not entirely distinct. She is simultaneously above us in a way that should inspire no alienation, even as she is with us. Second then, as the model of the development of the faith of the church, one can consider the Virgin Mary as, to quote Lumen Gentium, the type of the church in the order of faith, charity, and perfect union with Christ. Theologians sometimes speak in this sense of Mary as the imminent term, as the inner de of the inner development of the life of the church, when the life of the church reaches its teleological perfection and is most itself its Marian. Just as the church develops outwardly toward God, who is transcendent of the church, who remains distinct from the church as only God can be a God, um, the church also develops uh, towards greater degrees of participation in the life of grace, but she also develops inwardly towards a more Marian state, a state of more perfect union with God characterized by the Blessed Virgin Mary, who remains in this sense the eschatological icon of the church. That's the phrase of the catechism. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the eschatological icon. In other words, once more from Lumen Gentium, just as the mother of Jesus, glorified in body and in soul, is the image and beginning of the church, as it is to be perfected in the world to come, so too does she shine forth on earth. Notice again that's interesting uh, language of light, because it means she's in a certain way a kind of efficient cause or instrument of light. That's a very subtle question or problem theologically. Until the day of the Lord shall come as a sign of sure hope and solace to the people of God during its sojourn on earth. So, that's the, I finished the quote. So she teaches us what it is to become ever more ecclesial. Third and last, the unique privileges of the Virgin Mary that she does not share with us are of an importance not only to a proper theological understanding of God's work of salvation, but also in the ordinary lives of Christians. The Virgin Mary's Immaculate Conception, personal consecration of her virginity to God, divine maternity, meritorious suffering at the cross, her bodily assumption, and her queenship in heaven, Due to all of these, the Virgin Mary transcends in some real sense the common life of other Christian believers. However, and this is the key idea to hold all else together, precisely in her transcendent privileges that make her unique and like no other, the Virgin Mary is essential to the common good of, and the shared life of all believers in the church. It is because she alone is the mother of God and the mother of all the redeemed that a shared common life with her in the grace of Christ, forms an integral part of the supernatural good of all believers. It is the greatest joy of the believer to dwell with the Blessed Virgin Mary. No one makes us happier besides Jesus than Mary. The church is a place where human beings acquire a supernatural familiarity with and likeness to the Mother of God in faith and by the grace that calls them forth into a communion in which she is the preeminent member. Part of the happiness of being redeemed by Christ is the gift of being able to live in the company of the Virgin Mary, the first among the redeemed. There is no opposition here, then, between the unique privileges of the Virgin Mary and the common life of the church, for they are not one and the same, but the communion of the church is enriched in an irreplaceable and singular way by her distinct presence. The Virgin Mary is and remains not only the preeminent Christian disciple, then, and the model of all Christians. But she also is alone, the mother of God and the mother of the church. Thank you very much.